So hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Five Minutes Our Coma Talk on Onco Daily. I'm your host, Shushan Hovsepian, a pediatric oncologist from Armenia, and today we are honored to have Professor Leo Mascorenas join us to delve into the sarcoma world. The bi biography of Professor Mascarenas is too long. He is renowned uh, for his leadership in pediatric oncology and sarcoma research. Uh, he serves as the director of pediatric hematology and oncology at Cedar sinai Guarin Children's and the medical director of the sarcoma program at Cedar sinai Cancer in Los Angeles, California. And his research is focuses on mainly solid tumors, uh, rare tumors, uh, mostly soft uh, tissue sarcoma. So welcome, Professor Mascarenas, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you uh, for the kind invitation for me to speak to you, uh, Dr. Hobsapian. Uh, it's really an honor. Thank you. Thank you. The honor is all uh, mine. So let's get started. As you are leading the sarcoma program at Cedar sinai Cancer, what are the key goals and objectives of the program and what distinguishes it from other sarcoma programs, especially in terms of pedi uh, patient care and research initiatives? The, the major uh, point um, of our program here at Cedar sinai is that it spans all the entire age group with the, a group of dedicated specialists taking care of these patients. As you know, sarcomas uh, can occur at all ages from newborn babies till uh, old adulthood. And uh, sometimes care is administered uh, differently at different uh, institutions. Uh, uh, we have many fantastic children's hospitals uh, in in the U.S. and in Europe and other areas where uh, who are, the, have great expertise in taking care of pediatric sarcomas. Um, and there are many uh, large medical centers which have adult uh, sarcoma programs also. Um, and I think uh, sarcomas are unique in, the, in that they span the entire age group and their needs are potentially different during that time. But there's a big group of uh, these patients uh, uh, who are adolescents and young adults. And oftentimes in this age group, they can fall through the cracks uh, when they're transitioning from, you know, their parents' care to living on their own and navigating the healthcare system. And oftentimes, at least in the United States, it means uh, changing from a pediatric provider to a uh, adult provider for their care. And oftentimes that can be establishing care in different areas and not in the same continuum. Having said that, uh, you know, um, young adults also are still sort of dependent sometimes on their, on, on their parents, on other societies. Some of them are still students um, and have to go to college. Well, some of them also have to have jobs and take care of their livelihood uh, and have that independence. And decision-making is very important. Uh, so at CEDARS, we have one program, um, you know, which spans the age group uh, with a single uh, sort of overall leadership. And uh, we have a multidisciplinary team which meets every week, um, you know, and discusses all our sarcoma patients. And so we have the input of expert surgeons in different areas, uh, of radiologists, which cover different parts of the body. Uh, we also have pathology as well as genomic medicine, uh, in addition to medical and pediatric oncology, all working together for the care of our patients. And, uh, and so it's, it's a comprehensive program through the ages. Yeah, that's very uh, enlightening to uh, hear that uh, such kind of programs exist, which are uh, something that sets new standards of excellence in the field of sarcoma. And especially, thank you for highlighting the uh, challenges of uh, AYA patients. And I always remember that if uh, we see a 40 years old patient with rhabdomyosarcoma, they should be treated with pediatric oncologists, not only medical oncologists. And that, that is a really challenge, uh, not only in in the developed world, but also developing world. So let's uh, now turn our focus to the challenges. Uh, while um, um, as a leader in pediatric oncology, what challenges do you foresee in the implementing innovative uh, treatment strategies for sarcoma patients? And how do you uh, envision to address uh, that challenges? Yeah, uh, that is, uh, 
I think the word is truly a challenge. I think starting off with just sarcoma, right? I mean, broadly, there are bone sarcomas and soft tissue sarcomas. And in bone sarcomas, we have 10 or 20 different types of sarcomas. Uh, you know, there are several which are much more common, obviously. And depending on your age, uh, you know, uh, osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma are more common in children and young adults, while chondrosarcomas and other rarer sarcomas are more common in, in, in older adults. Um, with soft tissue sarcomas, there are over 100 different types of different sarcomas. And even though we call them sarcomas because their origin is in the mesenchyme or in the mesoderm uh, developmentally, uh, they uh, can be very, very different and have different biological features which actually drive them. Uh, they have different prognoses. There are some tumors which can be indolent and not give you trouble at all, even though they are malignant and very rarely metastasize. While there are some uh, uh, some sarcomas which are so aggressive and progress very very rapidly and they and, and treatment needs to be tailored according to the biology uh, in the past a lot of these patients were treated very very similarly i mean you know they started off with surgery if there was any tumor left behind with the surgeon they got radiation therapy and chemotherapy was an afterthought you know, in the last 50 years, we've realized that chemotherapy is important, especially for some of these high-grade lesions. And more recently, um, you know, uh, we've discovered certain oncogenic drivers in these sarcomas and fortunately have been able to target uh, a few of them. But I would also say that we target too few of them and there's a lot of work which actually needs to be done. So I think one of uh, the big challenges is how can we get away from lumping all sarcomas together and actually trying to study them in their purest form or if they're actually related in a tighter group of patients. And I think genomic medicine will help us with that. The other thing is sarcomas are still rare compared to all cancers, right? I mean, bone and soft tissue sarcomas probably comprise about around 10% of all uh, patients in children if you take them combined. And when you look at adults, they form about 1% uh, of all cancers in that area. So it's tough to sort of prioritize them when they are that few. So we really need a lot of advocacy in this area. We need committed individuals to actually work together. And by working together and having broad clinical trials, then uh, multiple sites can put patients on these trials and then we can learn uh, from this group of uh, patients. It's really hard, uh, uh, in my opinion, that one center will make a big difference in one particular uh, sarcoma care. So this is a field which we all have to work together, a true example of multidisciplinary care. Yeah, completely agree. Collaborative work in sarcomas is essential. So now that we uh, highlighted some of the challenges, let's uh, delve uh, deep into the history, a little bit of history. So how has the sarcoma biology evolved over the recent years and what therapeutic, therapeutic implications does this have? So like I said, initially they were all called sarcomas and it was based on a pathologist, you know, looking under a microscope and saying it looks like a sarcoma. I think the next big advantage was when, uh, you know, when uh, immunohistochemistry came along. And so by staining, we were able to find out what proteins these, these cancer cells produced. And so you could actually classify them uh, a little sure. better. In the early 1990s, we began to describe, uh, you know, the, the first fusions in sarcomas uh, were described, you know, in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. And then those became path pathognopic. And so what we've actually become very, very good at over the years is to help diagnose a condition correctly so that we no longer need to lump them uh, all together. And now with new advances in genomic medicine, um, you know, such as uh, uh, next generation sequencing, and we look at chromosomal microarray, we are able to learn a little more about these and see how these biological, different biological factors interact with each other and play with each other uh, to give us more information on how a patient's going to do, and also potentially how we can target uh, these fusions. 
Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I also wanted to discuss one of your recent articles, uh, which uh, I'm also interested in. Uh, could you please share uh, with our listeners, what were the key findings of your recent meta-analysis regarding the efficacy of minor albin in treating relapsed refractory alveolar and embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma? Yeah, we just, you know, using venerylbine and cyclophosphamide um, in, uh, in rhabdomyosarcoma at the time of relapse uh, seemed to be a reasonable strategy, particularly after the work which was done uh, in Italy by Dr. Casanova and colleagues, where they made the observation that the combination of venerylbine with oral cyclophosphamide benefited patients with rhabdomyosarcoma. Prior to that, uh, the children's oncology group had actually uh, conducted a phase two trial with venerylbine, um, and uh, that trial also showed uh, uh, responses in rhabdomyosarcoma compared to the other tumors which were treated. I was very fortunate to run a phase two, randomized phase two clinical trial uh, through the Children's Oncology Group, uh, which was a collaborative effort from the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee, where we tested venerylbine intravenous cyclophosphamide and two molecular targeted therapy agents. So this is really the first time in a pediatric sarcoma where we combined chemotherapy with a molecularly targeted therapy. And that trial actually turned out to be a positive trial where temsorolimus in combination with venerylbine and cyclophosphamide uh, basically, uh, you know, had an improved uh, advantage over the other arm, which had been cyclophosphamide and bevacizumab. And so in looking at these studies, it seemed to me that patients with alveolar histology perhaps may have had um, uh, a higher response rate. But on the other hand, we know that alveolar histology, particularly if it's associated with a FOXO1 fusion, those are the patients who have a higher risk of relapse. And so you know, there could have been a chance that they were just overrepresented in the group of patients which we were teaching. So we really wanted to explore that and say, is this a true effect of what we were seeing? Or is it just the fact that this was biased by a higher number of patients with alveolar disease participating? And so with our statistical colleagues, uh, you know, we were able to put together over 150 patients from five different trials based on the literature and actually showed that uh, the chance of responding with alveolar histology was about 40% higher compared to embryonal histology. Now, careful, that doesn't mean that patients with embryonal histology don't, you know, don't benefit from it. Uh, and so the way we assessed that was to look at the risk of progressive disease. So once you start the treatment, what happens to you? And there was actually no difference whether you had alveolar or embryonal histology. But in terms of causing a response, it appeared that uh, mineral being seen to cause, uh, no, caused higher responses in alveolar histology. And that was actually a, a strong preclinical data to launch the uh, high-risk metastatic disease trial, which is being conducted by the Children's Oncology Group, ARST2031, uh, where they're randomizing patients to get venerylbine, actinomycin, and cyclophosphamide versus the traditional vincristine, actinomycin, and cyclophosphamide. And hopefully we should have the results to that study within the next one to two years. Yeah, so the results are actually very promising uh, for vinorelbin, and I also personally think that uh, vinorelbin has uh, some role in uh, rhabdomyosarcoma patients and bringing it up front uh, will answer a lot of questions. So uh, now that we have explored some um, research findings, let's uh, take a moment to learn about your personal journey and experiences that led you to pursue a career in medicine and particularly in the field of pediatric oncology. Well, um, I, I've always wanted to be a physician from the time I was five or six years old, uh, and um, I just kept up with that passion. I was very, uh, I actually grew up in India and was very fortunate to go to an outstanding medical school where we got personalized attention and a great uh, opportunity for growth. And uh, during study, uh, my studies, I sort of fell in love with pathology. I mean, I found it most fascinating and 
Uh, and the oncology part of it was actually uh, really, really interested me. But I did not want to be a pathologist. I, as I said, how could, you know, and so I wanted to pursue uh uh, a clinical field where I could study uh, oncology. And initially, I thought I was going to be a surgical oncologist. And next, I thought I was going to be a gynecological oncologist. But when I did my rotations, I really fell in love with pediatrics. And, and so that's where the dream. And so then I specialized in pediatrics and then went on to do a fellowship in pediatric hematology and oncology at Children's Hospital Los Angeles in the United States uh, and, and gained a lot of experience with that area. And at the back of my mind, I still remember during my pediatric rotations in medical school, there was a six-year-old girl who was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. And in those days, we had nothing to offer them. So we actually sent that patient home on palliative care to pass away. And uh, I think that had an effect on me. And it was really strange so many years later that, you know, I worked with Ewing sarcoma and rhabdoma and sarcoma. Uh, the other thing is during my, you know, when I first started off, I, one of my mentors told me, don't take an easy problem, take on a tough problem if you want to really study it, because that's where all the efforts are needed. And so um, metastatic sarcomas had a terrible prognosis when I was training. They still have a bad prognosis. We've got a lot to work on it. Uh, but that's where, uh, you know, my research uh, focus began in doing clinical trials in these patients who have a really poor prognosis uh, uh, in, in pediatric solid tumors as well as sarcomas. And I was great for the opportunities which came my way and so many colleagues and mentors who have actually helped me along the way uh, to really have a career which uh, I find very, very engaging and, uh, and I think I get as much out of it as I put into it also and so hopefully we'll be able to continue in this field for a few more years. Yeah, that's very motivational. And uh, as uh, you mentioned about your mentor, my mentor, Professor Tamamian, is also saying that don't take easy patients, always take uh, the difficult patients because uh, that is the way to learn and force yourself uh, to find the solutions for uh, even for uh, impossible things. So, yeah, and that's very, very good advice. All right. I mean, and we live in a field where we need hope. All of us need hope, including our patients, so that we could actually all do better, uh, you know, uh, to really hopefully make things better for all our patients and for science and for uh, the world in general. Yeah, exactly. And uh, on this positive note, uh, I would like uh, to thank you for accepting our invitation. It was an honor for me. And thank you for your dedication and commitment to making mm. a difference in the lives of sarcoma patients. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hovsepian, and all the best to you and all your efforts to you. And I'm sure we'll meet each other at several different meetings around, or if not, virtually. Yeah, right. for sure. Take care. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.